right? Session number four, which is the trauma effect, how the trauma effects of substance use disorders. We've got uh, Lisa Ruddick, who's going to talk about the opioid crisis. Hi, Lisa. Then we're going to have Brad Fine, Fine Good back uh, to discuss fentanyl use among young people, and then Phil Martin to discuss uh, his work with human trafficking issues and the correlation of substance use to human trafficking victims. So Lisa, let me introduce Lisa. <clears throat> she is the director of addiction studies program at Antioch University, where she teaches master's level counselors and professionals how to effectively work with co-occurring disorders, as well as the intersection between trauma, attachment, injuries, and addiction. And that's just, boy, that's that's right where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> and for nearly two decades, Lisa has helped individuals, couples, and families impacted by addiction. She is a licensed uh, mental health counselor and substance use disorder professional in the state of Washington. Lisa has training in models uh, informed by the neuroscience of human attachment and trauma, including level one internal family systems and level two sensory motor psychotherapy training. That's mouthful. Got you got it. <laughs> I got it out. All right. And uh, so Lisa, thanks so much for being here. We'll let you kick it off and then I'll, we'll get to Brad uh, next. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Council Member Dunn. So thank you so much for inviting me to talk a little bit about opiates, uh, substance use disorder, addiction, and trauma. Uh, these are very big topics, so I'm going to do my best to distill them down to a couple of important takeaways for our audience today. Um, you can go ahead with the next slide. Just so we know what opiates, opioids are, uh, there's a lot of different names that float around. And so this slide is just a, a little bit of a, a visual sound bite, if you will, on um, opiates and semi-synthetic opiates and synthetic opiates. So you'll hear those names in different publications and different research. Um, when you hear semi-synthetic opiates, we're speaking about heroin, hydrocodone, oxycodone, oxycontin. When we're talking about synthetic opiates, the ones made in a lab, it's going to be fentanyl, methadone, tramadol. You've probably heard some of these. Go ahead with the next slide. Um, I really, anybody that is um, in a position to where uh, current research statistics and a synthesis or assimilation of information would be really, really helpful. I would very much encourage you to read the Surgeon General's report on opiates. Um, the Surgeon General also put out uh, a, a report on addiction, which is really, they're both really, really well done. Uh, in the Surgeon General's report, they use SAMHSA's 2017 uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health um, Services Administration Report statistics. And just so that we have some idea of prevalence, and of course, these are from 2017, so we don't know how these have changed, um, that, that, will, that research is being amassed. But as far as the 2017 report goes, 11.1 million people ages 12 and older misuse prescription pain medication. 1.7 million ages 12 and over met criteria for opiate substance use disorder. Almost a million people receive treatment and that number reflects the people that received treatment, not the people that needed treatment and 652,000 over the age of 12 estimated to have heroin use disorder. Next slide. The Surgeon General's report also points to three trends that have been contributing to the opioid crisis. One is that prescription drug overdose deaths have been on the rise since for the last 20 years. There are four times more heroin overdoses since 2010. And the death rate from synthetic opioids like fentanyl has tripled since 2013. Next slide. There's an important piece of research. It was a major contribution to the medical field done by Vincent Felitti called the Adverse Childhood Experiences. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the ACEs. 
And what this research showed was a very strong link between adverse childhood experiences and chronic medical conditions. And those chronic medical conditions include mental health issues and include substance use disorder and addiction. So it was very concrete data that pointed to the fact that when children grow up with adverse childhood experiences, which can be the root and cause of a traumatized nervous system, they are more vulnerable to mental health issues and more vulnerable to substance use disorder and addiction. According to this research, 61% of adults surveyed across 25 states reported at least one adverse childhood experience and one out of six reported four or more. So um, the prevalence of adverse childhood experiences is wide and it's something that we all need to be dialed into when we're on the front line working with people. Next slide. Bessel van der Kolk is one of the leading people in the field of trauma research. And in his book, The Body Keeps the Score, referencing the ACEs research, he points out that injection drug use increased exponentially for those with ACEs of a score uh, six or more the likelihood of IV drug use was 4,600% greater than those with a score of zero. Next slide. So there can be many, many, many sources of trauma. And most of the families that I've worked with and parents that I've worked with over the course of the last 20 years, I really can't think of one that has intentionally set out to traumatize their child. Um, I think that one of the things that is really common in the people that I have worked with is the, the idea of uh, generational trauma, um, where traumas have been passed down generation to generation. Uh, traumatized, dysregulated nervous systems have raised children that have then caused chronically traumatized, dysregulated nervous systems in the children. Um, and some of these things that people survive are really not anything anybody would choose, racial trauma, uh, people that survive natural disasters and uh, are forced to live in conditions where there may be food scarcity, they might be homeless, um, other things that sometimes we don't even think of as sources of trauma like unaddressed learning needs. Children will go through the education system in terror of being humiliated or with experiences of being humiliated in front of their peers and, and in classrooms. Um, unsupported peer group interpersonal dynamics. Uh, there are, unfortunately, when kids have uh, un, unaddressed, untreated, traumatized nervous systems, they tend to act that out with other peers. And so they can also, you know, we've heard the expression, hurt people hurt people. Neglect, abuse, sexual trauma, and longstanding ritualized abuse are some of the ones that we are more familiar with, but all of these things can create a, a nervous system and contribute to a nervous system that is chronically dysregulated and doesn't really have experience with feeling safe. It doesn't really have an experience with seeing people as a resource or people as trustworthy or uh, is living with chronic feel feelings and fears of the bottom dropping out or um, not really being able to relax. Next slide. We've learned so much in the last few decades from the neuroscience of human attachment. The neuroscience of human attachment has really helped us understand how nervous system to nervous system, we operate as neurobiological regulators for one another. So, in optimal caregiving, the caregiver is a neurobiological regulator for the nervous system that is growing and developing. Next slide. We've all heard the expression survival of the fittest, but it's actually more accurate to say that those who are nurtured best survive the best when it comes to the human species. Louis Casalino is a major contributor to the neuroscience of human relationships, and that's his quote. And what he and others in this field have been able to share with us in their research endeavors is that 
when we have a secure attachment experience, when our homes are a safe place, a sanctuary, a place where we can go out into the world, school with our peers, the environment, and become stressed and learn lessons and then go back and um, regulate and uh, restore and recuperate and learn and process and work through feelings. Uh, all of these things are possible. We can be hopeful about the future. We can have imagination and dream big dreams. Uh, we can learn ways to deal with stress and deal with our emotions and um, people are trustworthy for the most part. And we learn how to discern between the ones who are and the ones who aren't. When we have help and support growing up and we're developing and we have caregiving that helps us uh, have boundaries and supports us and having boundaries and limits and communicating our thoughts and feelings and needs. We're able to do that in adolescence more, although adolescence for everybody, I'm not sure I would want to relive adolescence. It's a trying time. Um, but we're also then able to carry all those skills and all of that um, coping into our adult lives and um, face life, you know, with all of its trials and tribulations in a way that allows us to have relationships and allows us to grow and, and do the things that we want to do and be competent in the things that we're gifted in and in bringing into the world. So next slide, please. What happens when the caregiving is traumatizing? That's what we're working with as counselors in the substance use disorder, treatment, addiction, and trauma field. So unfortunately, again, I don't know that I can think of any parent that has come into my office and said, I have intentionally tried to traumatize my child, but because they have their own unresolved trauma, because they're the nervous system becomes triggered or activated with when their child is distressed. Um, for somebody that has a nervous system that's traumatized, crying is very activating of fear, terror, overwhelm, um, hopelessness, helplessness. Um, if parents don't know how to calm themselves down and don't know how to manage the stress that is active in their body, they're not really gonna be able to do that for their children. And unfortunately, then what happens is there's this sort of amping up of dysregulation in homes. So parents become dysregulated by the very natural state of, of adolescents, infants, toddlers, children, and then adolescents is dysregulated. That's very natural and normal. Um, and you know, in a, for human species, uh, the, the hope or the ideal is that the parent can be the, the regulator to the little nervous systems that are always distressed and always changing and always fluctuating in arousal levels. But when those arousal levels bring on hypervigilance or put parents in a fight state or a flight state, which is really where the human species body goes when it's trauma triggered, will go into fight, flight, freeze, or submit. Um, and when, when those is what are, are the places where people are operating from in response to their kids, unfortunately, that will impact the child in a very similar way that the parent was impacted and often be the source of trauma. Next slide. So what do kids do? is kind of what they're supposed to be doing developmentally, which is to explore and experiment. And in children and adolescents, I mean, as you saw, the statistics from the Surgeon General's report are 12 and older, right? So when we're talking about children and then middle school and adolescents, once they're able to be out in the world more with peers more, maybe in schools or other community environments, they start to experiment with things that will make them feel better. They start to uh, show each other what they're learning about things that make them feel better. And there are a variety of things that kids turn to and there are a variety of thing, different things that work with certain particular nervous systems. So depending on how the nervous system is overstimulated and activated, 
um, the level of hypervigilance, how that nervous system, does it go into fight a lot? Does it go into flight a lot? Does it go into submit a lot? All can be contributing factors to the substance that a person starts to seek out as a solution for developing the ability to deal with a nervous system that is chronically overrun with stress. They cannot keep up with the amount of feelings. They cannot keep up with the amount of terror. They cannot keep up with the amount of anxiety. They cannot keep up with the amount of material inside of their system that they need to process. And unfortunately, because this is very unaddressed and there are certain barriers for certain groups and populations and families that don't have access to treatment and good mental health counseling, a lot of this goes unaddressed. So they're living with this alone. In isolation, often kids are feeling even alienated from peers. I feel like they're lucky if they have a peer group that they can bond and find some amount of sanctuary in. For medical uses, opiates, opioids are used to control pain, depress coughing. They're used when people have diarrhea, chronic diarrhea. With regards to people who are seeking them out to help find some relief, uh, they numb emotional pain. Uh, they produce a rush or euphoric uh, sensations and experience. And then eventually when people's physiology becomes more dependent on opiates, these individuals are ending up using to prevent really excruciating and painful withdrawal symptoms. So as any of us on the front lines have experience with watching or walking through with somebody in withdrawal from opiates, it's incredibly painful and uncomfortable, often needs medical supervision to do safely. Um, and it's also what is referred to as dope sickness. Next slide. So I think about this for myself uh, to conceptualize work with my clients and families as um, having compound fractures. And why is this important? Why am I, why am I going um, into this with all of you is, I, you know, no matter what our position, no matter what our role with people that we're serving or people we're interacting with, um, along the same lines as what Sharon was speaking to, it's incredibly important to have compassion and to have healthy, realistic expectations of what individuals are going through. Um, we have clients that uh, have many, in some cases, off the charts, adverse childhood experiences. And these adverse childhood experiences in many cases create trauma in the nervous system and cause, a tra or cause for a traumatized nervous system. When people seek out substances to use, and then initially, if you listen to their narratives, if you if you listen to them sharing in group, and as you get to know them, they they say, you know, at, and in the beginning, this really helped. I thought that this was going to be the answer for me. It helped me feel more a part of. It helped me feel less anxious. It helped me go to sleep at night. You know, the nighttime is probably one of the worst times for people with trauma, especially kids, because a lot of times, nighttime is the time when it happens. So this ends up, you know, presenting initially as a solution as do many other things that we work with clinically, eating disorders, um, it, um, cutting is a tension reducing strategy that's really effective. Um, and interestingly enough, connected to this, to this talk and this topic, uh, it's because it, re it, it releases our natural, um, response to pain, it releases endorphins in that initially um, cutting. So um, kids and adolescents find things that initially present as a solution to them finding periods of relief. It's like their nervous system can, can find sanctuary for a window of time. Now, as we know, once a substance use disorder continues to progress and gets into the more moderate severe end of the spectrum and or is addiction, it's developed a life of its own. The thing that was the solution is now running the show and it is completely hijacked the nervous system. 
So there ends up being a lot more consequences, a lot more negative feedback from the environment. I'm really, really so grateful to Sharon for sharing what she did regarding language because all of that language and all of that reinforcement and feedback coming back to kids and adolescents is happening at a time when their identity is forming. So they become very over-identified with a fight response as who they are, a flight response as who they are, an addict as who they are, the messages they're getting from teachers and administrators in the community and law enforcement as who they are. And that further sort of complicates the clinical picture for, for counselors. So also what can happen in active addiction is that because this nervous system is hijacked, it's going to be in situations that can be further traumatizing. Addiction is a condition that makes people vulnerable to being hurt further. It makes people vulnerable to situations to where they can be exploited and assaulted. So oftentimes people are accumulating traumas while they're in active addiction. So when people are coming into our offices for help, next slide please, we really, really need to, oh, next slide please. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we really, really need to be and hold compassion for what they're dealing with um, because these are nervous systems that oftentimes do not have any kind of frame of reference for being safe. They don't know what rest is. They don't know what relaxation is. In fact, in a lot of cases in families, relaxation is very activating of trauma because sometimes when you know they've had experiences when they were relaxing and they didn't see anything coming or they were sleeping and didn't see anything coming and all of a sudden we're being assaulted. Right, so then the cue for that becomes relaxation. So they're, they've been living in a chronically hypervigilant state for years and years and years. And next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and we're asking them to do a whole bunch of um, things that while healthy and are great steps towards recovery, are great steps towards healing, are great steps towards receiving help, are incredibly activating of their trauma. So please remember when you're interacting with people that you suspect have had a hard go of it and have some cumulative traumas as well as addiction, please keep in mind that often that trauma happened in the context of a relationship. So even though we have really good intentions and we're really caring and loving people and we want to help, we have to remember that even our offer of help is activating of stress for many, many people, especially adolescents and kids. They just don't have the trust. So what we can do is be patient. We can be patient, we can be compassionate, and we can have a healthy, realistic expectation for people in terms of what it's actually gonna take them to do some of the things we're asking them to do, which is to open up in group and share feelings, which they've been phobic up for a really long time and have overrun them and overwhelmed them. And they haven't really had any help in processing or any help in coping. We're asking them to establish relationships and recovery is full of relationships with the counselor, with the group, with in a lot of cases, 12 step community. And while we need to support them in making those steps because that is where the healing can occur, we also just need to remember when people are having a hard time opening up in group to not use, I mean, to sort of um, dovetail off of what Sharon spoke about, to be really careful about how we're describing their participation in the words we're using. Are we using strengths-based language? Or are we saying things like, this client is a treatment resistant client. This client isn't getting it. This client isn't opening up in group. This client doesn't know how to make uh, use of recovery or doesn't know how to make use of group. I mean, all of those things um, are, to my mind, if I'm consulting with a team or I'm coming in or when I'm, I'm doing work with clients, those, when I see those things in people, to, to my mind, it just means, oh, this is going to take some time because clearly this is, it, this is presenting as more of a threat than a help. When we see fight, flight, freeze, and submit, we know the thing is presenting as more of a threat than help, and we just need to slow down, be patient, get curious, explore with clients about how we can help them feel safer in group. How can we feel, help them feel safer 
in their day-to-day -day life. And my last slide here, um, if you can go to the next slide, thank you so much. Um, in trauma recovery, um, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> back again, so sorry. Back to the last one, yeah, thank you. In trauma recovery, there are many, many, many teachers and mentors that I've had and leaders in the field that use and conceptualize the trajectory of trauma recovery. Substance use disorder and addiction recovery is thought to be a process as well. Um, and I've listed some of them here. Pierre Genet was one of the first, Judith Herman, Bessel van der Kolk, Danina Fisher, and Pat Ogden. Um, all talk about phase or stage oriented treatment of trauma. And the very first one, I, I haven't put uh, phase two and phase three on here. Phase two is working through, which is a longer process and really needs to be done in the context of a counseling relationship where there's a very strong therapeutic alliance and you've been working with somebody for a while. And phase three is about maintenance. But phase one is really relevant because this is where we're mostly interacting with people initially. And it's just all about stabilization. And what you can really do you know, to help is just to, to contribute to the effort of helping these individuals find some stability in their day-to-day -day life. Um, and as you can see, the word safety appears on this slide multiple times. Um, safety, safety, safety. Do they have food? Do they have a warm place to sleep? Do they have access to medical care? Do they have access to treatment? Do they have access to the appropriate level of care of treatment? Okay, because if they need detox or they need residential care, you know, more needs to be done to increase access. I, I would just, my, I would just, my dreams, all my dreams would come true if all the people that needed treatment could get treatment. Um, counseling, coping skills, identifying resources, identifying activities, friend groups, peer groups, anything that's going to help whoever you're working with at whatever age and wherever they're coming through the door to get a, a life for themselves, you know, to be able to have a little bit of, and, and then we hopefully we build on that and build on that um, to where they're living a life that, and getting some rest and starting to be able to experience some windows of relief that don't involve things that ultimately cause harm like substance use disorder and addiction. I just really wanna thank you so much for coming today and um, being open to all the information that the speakers have been sharing. Thank you so much for listening and I really hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Lisa, <clears throat> thank you so much for that. That was some very important and fascinating information uh, and absolutely right on from my perspective. So we appreciate very much your work in this area and, and thanks for that participation. Thank you uh, for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. And so we'll continue on within this uh, session for the trauma effect. We're gonna um, come back uh, to uh, uh, Brad Feingood who presented uh, this morning. And as I mentioned, he's a strategic advisor at Public Health Seattle King County. Um, Brad, uh, why don't you go ahead and start your presentation? Thanks again for being a, a repeat customer here today. Oh, well, it's just been an honor to take part today, Council Member Dunn. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to be talking just a little bit about fentanyl, and I'll be quick. Uh, you heard a lot from me this morning, um, and I am super excited to get to some of my colleagues and friends this afternoon um, to hear their stories and hope. Uh, Carolyn and Erica are just amazing people with amazing stories to offer to everybody today. Um, the reason why I, it was so important for me to talk about fentanyl today is because fentanyl is really just such a game changer for us in the substance use um, and uh, drug use realm in the county, in the state, and nationally. If you can uh, go to the next slide. I think one of the things that's really important that Lisa talked about just a moment ago is that there's some level of normalcy with experimentation with drugs with youth. And so it's about that risk-taking behavior. If we looked at the neuroreceptor cells that Caleb was talking about earlier and that Sharon was talking about with youth, they're not really aligned. I can speak from personal experiences uh, when I was a teenager and then when I was a youth and that risk-taking behavior was high. The full frontal brain is not fully developed, which means that we can't 
necessarily make sound choices. Um, think about many of the choices that you all made when you were in that adolescent time period and those younger 20s, they're very different uh, than the time period um, that were that uh, many of us are in now as older adults. I was looking at that headshot of me and how much grayer my beard has got in such short amount of time. I put this picture up there because it's really difficult, if not impossible, to tell the difference between a fake counterfeit pill and a real counterfeit pill. The only way that somebody can know that they're that they're getting a real counterfeit, I'm sorry, that they're getting a real prescription medication is if they get it directly from the pharmacy, directly from the hospital, directly from your doctor. Um, otherwise, as the data I pre presented this morning, you can pretty much assume that it is going to be fake. Um, you can keep going. So one of the questions that we had once we started to learn about counterfeit pills and that's how fentanyl was coming in and that the lethality risk was so high is why are people using and do they know that um, they're using counterfeit pills or do they really think that they're using safe, effective medications. You can keep going. So we did some qualitative research. We contracted with a group called Rescue Agency um, to take a look at um, to take a look at why it is. And so we uh, through Rescue Agency, we um, engaged um, a number of different uh, 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 people who self-proclaimed use pills. Um, we wanted to know why are they using um, you know, what's their motivation? Do they know that they were using as I was talking about earlier? So we, we were able to gain some really important insights. And again, why is this important is because um, youth tend to be experimental. They tend to not start with drugs that are really down the path. Um, they tend to start with things that they feel are safe. So some of the things that we learned are high risk teens uh, have easy access to drugs through the internet. Right, and not just through the internet, through social media. So Snapchat and Instagram, not Facebook. Facebook is uh, for a lot of people of, uh, I would say my generation, although I don't have Facebook, but um, social media platforms are really easy um, to be able to exchange information around drug availability. A lot of people use Snapchat because the messages went away uh, fast. And so um, there wasn't that proof or that line, but that is how a lot of people um, connect with people around, uh, around drug use and around the availability, especially around the availability of, um, of these counterfeit pills. Uh, most of the participants, the youth did not think about the source or consider the trustworthiness of the source prior to trying uh, a drug offered by a trusted friend or family member. So they trust the people around them. I'll tell you a quick story. So once we started to see these blue M30 pills, and I keep coming back to those blue M30 pills, because that's how we're seeing this, these counterfeit pills and these fentanyl that continue to kill people. Um, I went to my own kids and I asked my own kids if they knew about it. I was like, hey, you know, these are pills. We had um, at the end of 2019, we had a number of deaths uh, in Seattle and on the east side and, uh, and in South County that, um, that took us by surprise. They were high school students who were uh, outward facing, very good students, all that type of stuff. And so I came home and I asked my kids, I was like, hey, do you know about these pills? And my 19 year old told me a whole lot more than I knew about them. He's like, yeah, look, it's on Snapchat, it's on Instagram, here it is. I can tell you, this is a counterfeit pill. This is what it looks like. And this is how, how kids are getting fentanyl. And I was like, okay, give them, all, give them to me. And he, luckily he didn't have any or he didn't report to have any, but he knew all about it. So information is very much exchanged via social media for youth. Um, another thing that we learned is youth really wanted concrete actions about what they can take. So there's a number of things that, so it wasn't just enough to say, hey, there's fentanyl in these pills, but it's like, what can you do? So recognizing the signs of overdose, knowing about the Good Samaritan law, knowing that what the Good Samaritan law is, is that you can't be arrested for possession um, or being on the scene if somebody is in an active overdose, if you call 911. So we want people to be able to call 911 and also to carry naloxone or Narcan, um, the uh, opiate overdose antidote that reverses overdose deaths. We haven't talked a lot about naloxone today, but it's an amazing tool. It's sort of like kryptonite is the Superman 
if Superman was bad and kryptonite was good or something like that. Um, but it reverses the effects of, uh, of an opioid overdose and can stop people from dying. You can go to the next one. So as was talked about earlier, um, there's primarily two reasons why people use drugs and why youth are using drugs. One is for sensation seeking, right? Like experimentation, as we were talking about earlier. And the second is to cope with the mental health challenges. And we know, as Council Member Dunn talked about this morning, those council, those those um, mental health challenges are often exacerbated during COVID isolation, depression, anxiety. And we know, as Council Member Dunn talked about, like extremely eloquently, the opposite of addiction isn't necessarily recovery, but it's connection. And that Leo was talking about this morning. Like, so when people lose connection to other people, it leads to social isolation. The other thing to talk about here that's really important to understand is these youth who are using, um, who, who may be using pills might not have a full substance use disorder or addiction like we talked about earlier. So it's a total game changer for us because it doesn't allow people, as we've talked about stories of hope today, as we've talked about recovery today, um, these pills and the, the lethality risk of these pills um, make it so that people may never ever have that chance to gain recovery. And so it's really important to find ways to keep people alive and engage with them um, in open conversation before um, before they get to the point where something really bad happens. You can go to the next slide. So high-risk teens who uh, use substances are knowledgeable about the substances we found. Um, and in fact, a lot of people who are using these counterfeit pills also are, are starting to use other drugs. We see a lot of alcohol uh, use with folks. We also see other types of pill use. Um, we often see uh, cocaine use also. So other drugs that are sort of lower on the stigmatized scale, don't require needles, all of that type of stuff. Um, so um, also uh, when we did these focus groups, participants uh, mentioned fentanyl and or naloxone. Um, and so they're very, very knowledgeable. Again, a lot of this information comes to them from peers or from social media. Um, High-risk teens are not, currently, uh, are not currently connecting the fentanyl overdose risk with their own behavior. Um, so they know that there's fentanyl in these pills, but the, but the um, amazingly difficult part to comprehend is even though they know the lethality risk, they still trust their source and their friend group and they're still using. I wanna bring up one real important point right now, which is that um, although youth often know about counterfeit pills and fentanyl, adults don't. Um, adults get information very differently than youth do. And so what we're seeing now is um, as, uh, as these pills come into our community more and more, more and more adults are now dying of uh, fentanyl overdose who have things like chronic pain and who may be getting cut off from prescription medication from their providers. And so they're, they're, get, they're looking for what, what in previous and years past were a lot of prescription opiates that were um, illegally sold or whatnot are now really counterfeit pills. And, um, and those folks are, are, are dying now too. So in addition to um, everything, it's super important that people know that this, is, that this is a thing out there and it's contributing to a huge number of overdose deaths. Uh, next one, next slide. So what we did with the youth and the adults is we did some brand testing. And so um, we are rolling out a campaign right now um, that is gonna be an ongoing campaign for quite a long period of time around fentanyl overdose deaths. We're using some local mental illness and drug dependency sales tax money, like was talked about earlier this morning with some um, CDC money that we're getting to, uh, to, do, some, uh, to do some knowledge um, work around, um, around fentanyl overdose. So we're turning out this laced and lethal campaign, which is where most folks, um, uh, the, what, what, what most folks uh, could be able to identify with. Ne next slide. So um, our website, lacedandlethal.com, is, um, is a website that we're rolling out right now. Um, a lot of the youth focus campaign, we are, um, we are rolling out, uh, making available to the community, want the community to know about on the laceandlethal.com um, uh, webpage, access to naloxone, the overdose antidote, uh, concrete things that people can do um, to raise awareness and help raise awareness for youth and adults around fentanyl overdose. So we want people to know uh, about that laceandlethal.com. 
uh, last slide. So the last thing I want to leave you with, and this is really just sort of reiterating a lot of things Lisa said, is how it is to how to talk to a youth about it, right? So if you are in a situation, it's it's good to talk to the youth to talk to youth about any of this type of stuff. I had this conversation with my 13 year old yesterday, and it's not a conversation that you want to approach with negativity or anything like that. It's a conversation about how do we talk. It's a conversation about what do you know, and let's talk about it, right? Um, so approach with curiosity. So this is how I approach my kids. So what do you know about it? Do you know anything about it? Avoid judgment, right? Don't point fingers. If they know about it, don't shame them. Um, validate safe conversations um, and be fact-based, not fear-based. Um, and so if you do those things, um, then you will be able to have vibrant conversations with your youth about what is going on. Um, and we can raise all those protective factors like Lisa was talking about. And that's all I got. Thank you so much. Wow, that's really great, Brad. Yeah, I, I will tell you that conversation like that with, with your children and young people, that's a, a tough one to have, but of course, an important one to have. And you're right, not judgmental is important. I did get a question. I don't know. It's a great question, I think, but here's the question. Maybe somebody can take a crack at it. Has any research been done on whether someone who is trying to recover does better surrounded by folks who are in recovery as well. Anybody know that? Phil, Brad, anybody? I, uh, I don't, I don't know of any research, um, you know, Sharon or Lisa who are uh, sort of steeped in the academic of it might, but I, I do know that people uh, tend to uh, uh, collaborate and associate better when they see people around them that they know and feel and connect to. That's why, you know, the fellowship of 12-step programs, programs like Recovery Cafe, uh, you feel a sense of connectedness to and that you are no different than those people. That's certainly my experience, Brad. Lisa or Sharon, anybody want to take a crack at that? Yeah, I would really just echo what um, what Brad is saying. Uh, you know, it uh, this can be there can be a lot of shame associated with both trauma and addiction. People have been hiding secrets, keeping things to themselves. They are fearful of being embarrassed, humiliated, ashamed, shamed by somebody who they open up to, and so um, there's a lot of isolation and alienation. So. Um, you know, certainly anybody that your clients or anybody that you're, you're in a helping role with finding places where, you know, they feel a sense of camaraderie with others, they feel connected to others. And um, of course, people going through the same thing is a good place to start, but that's not necessarily the only source available to people. We want to use really anything that we have available to us to help people heal and feel a part of. Absolutely. That's great. Thanks, Lisa. Sharon, want to correct? I would just add too that, um, you know, we've talked about and later we're going to hear some panelists that have been successful, but the idea of being around people that have some long-term success and that we're able to do this, I think one that that provides some hope. Um, and then two, um, in my experience, individuals with substance use disorders are so hard on themselves. And um, sometimes encouraging them to look at themselves, how someone in their group or a peer or someone else would look at them or what they would say to them versus what they're saying to themselves can be really helpful. So the, the benefit of a peer recovery group can be, gosh, you know, Brad's a great guy and he's so um, hard on himself and he was just trying to do his best and um, you know, so maybe I can forgive myself a little bit. Maybe I can, you know, put some of that compassion that I would give to another person onto myself and maybe what I'm hearing and what I'm saying to other people, I could say to myself. So certainly, you know, um, I don't have a research information to quote, but those, that would be, you know, it gives hope. And then it also helps to kind of reflect a little bit of self-compassion. The last thing I would say to that real quick is it's really important also for people to feel comfortable engaging in individual counseling and therapy because there may not be things that they're ready to divulge with their peers or people around them. So a combination of people like them around them, but also a, a safe place where they can feel that they can uh, maybe emote and get some things off their chest without, without that immediate um, 
you know, feeling of shame or guilt, whether that's something that somebody else brings on them or something they internalize. Yeah, for years, I wouldn't go to AA meetings and it's because I was afraid I was going to be recognized. Well, there's council member Don. He's, a, you know, one of these terms that Sharon talked about, some highly stigmatized. And uh, I, I'm really, really wish I, I had been comfortable to be more public earlier. I did individual work with somebody and I'm glad I did. But yeah, my experience is that individual and group both are really important. You do a little bit of, of each. And I also think that, uh, you know, working with somebody who's been through it is helpful, but there's a lot of professionals out there that are very close to it for a variety of reasons. Maybe they had a family member or friend or whatever, but anyone who's providing help and care and, and doing it with compassion is really where you want to start. And like the folks we have on here today. So thank you for that. In fact, even the name of this conference, I, we struggled mightily over how we were terming this conference. We went with uh, conference on addiction disorders, and uh, I realized that addiction is a somewhat tough word. I mean, if you call somebody, "Hey, you're an addict," you know that poo that can just lose it right off the bat. Uh, I wanted to sweep in the general public a little bit, and it's a term they understand for right or wrong. We'll get into it. So I reserve the right to change the name of this conference next year. I hope, but. But I uh, just want to know the people I struggle with even what to call this conference. So next we got uh, Philip Martin and Phil, thanks for being here. And he's outreach coordinator for adult and teen challenge, very uh, well-known organization in our community. Um, he's uh, been active in, in youth and college ministry since his teenage years and in, in his early twenties came across the opportunity to be involved in the internship program at church home, the city church. Phil is involved with the anti-trafficking movement and is connected with several nonprofit organizations locally, nationally, and internationally that operate in that capacity. Um, he has been actively fighting human trafficking for over a decade. He's also involved in his local church. They help those who are recovering from drug and alcohol addiction, along with other life controlling problems. So Phil, welcome. Thanks for being here and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, uh, Councilman Dunn, for uh, having me. Um, for those of you that don't know um, about the uh, organization of Adult and Teen Challenge, we've actually been around for quite some time, uh, since the 1960s. Uh, to be exact, we started in uh, New York City, um, and so we've been around ever since then. And um, we, are, we help those that are struggling with drug and alcohol addiction, but we also say other life-controlling problems. Um, so we don't just strictly help people that are you know, only focused on drugs and alcohol, but we really like to get to the root cause. Um, of their addiction. And so we have centers um, all over uh, the United States and around the world uh, for men, women, and also adolescents. Um, I'm a part of our men's center, uh, which is located here in uh, Renton, Washington. And us uh, um, in the past, just to help out with uh, some of our transportation needs um, and so forth. So I know you're familiar with our center. And uh, so we're thankful for your donation um, just to help us in that regard. It really helps a ton uh, for what we're trying to do with the guys. Um, and then I'm a part of our uh, Northwest region, which encompasses um, our centers here in Washington, uh, Oregon, Alaska, Idaho, and Montana. So that's, I work a lot within our region um, as well. So uh, working with our different outreach coordinators um, at our different centers. Um, and all of that. So I'm pretty involved, uh, to say the least, in, in all of our work with the community, uh, fundraising efforts, partnerships, all of that. Um, the people that come into our centers, they come and they live there for a full year. So we're a full uh, inpatient, we're a biblical uh, based program. So we're a faith based program. So everything is, you know, provided to them. Um, they bring their some clothes that they have maybe on their backs when they first come in. But uh, all the foods provided to them, they come and live for a full year, their transportation, we take them to their medical and doctor's appointments, counseling appointments. Um, they have classes that they go to throughout the week, Monday through Thursday. Some of those are biblical, you know, base classes, but then some are dealing with relapse prevention um, and some others. So we have different speakers that come in from uh, different agencies that we partner with or with from different local churches, maybe they're pastors or counselors at churches, they come in and actually, uh, you know, relate with our guys. So it's a great program for them to be involved with. I think really the success of our program um, is because we're both a faith-based program, 
Um, and then we're also offer them just a lot of practical information um, as far as just understanding, you know, what is it like to go to work every day? What does it mean to be prompt? What does it mean to, you know, just be accountable to other people, those kind of things. And so, you know, they're involved with going to work throughout the week. Um, they're involved in their counseling sessions. They're involved in outreaches in the community, um, you know, sharing their testimonies in churches with me on Sundays when I'm speaking at churches, um, all those kind of things. And so we keep them pretty busy uh, throughout the week. Um, I really think that the success behind our program, it said that um, those that graduate from our program and they complete the full 12 months, we have an 80% success rate um, that people don't relapse again once they graduate, if they fully complete. And I really think that the biggest point for us is that we're a faith-based program um, that really helps them in, along their recovery because they really know who they are, you know, particularly in Christ. Um, and then in return, they have gained all the other information, you know, that they've gained from their experience with us and just the accountability and relationships. Um, we see great success, you know, from people who really commit for the full 12 months um, in our program. So that's just a little uh, bit of background on our organization. When it comes to the issue of human trafficking, um, this is something that is a newer endeavor for us, actually. Um, this has not been a part of our organization for, for a long time, but in my discussion with some of our directors, um, and with our executive team as well, um, particularly with our women's campuses, we're noticing um, that a lot of the individuals that come uh, through the intake process, the centers are not able to fully um, treat the addiction because they've been so traumatized because of their trafficking experience that they've been through. And so it just goes hand in hand really with everything that we're doing. Um, and there's a great sense of urgency for us right now to really um, adhere to that. And so um, just with how long we've been around, um, I just have felt like we needed to provide an answer, you know, to that problem too, specifically here in Seattle with how big of a problem it is um, in our area in Washington state as well. So this is somewhat of a newer effort for us, um, but I've been involved with, uh, as Reagan mentioned in the introduction with different nonprofit organizations um, here in Washington, um, you know, in different states around the world really for the last uh, 10 years. Um, and so I've been around the field for quite some time, but. This is newer for Teen Challenge. But uh, so when I was thinking about just what I wanted to share, I know I've only got about uh, five, six minutes, but uh, when I was thinking about what I wanted to share, this really could be um, an exhaustive you know, list. This could go on for a while. But um, the correlation between those uh, battling through addiction uh, and survivors of human trafficking. So they have a similar upbringing or background. Um, and then these are just a few commonalities um, that I see. Um, in them. So they have, you know, family dysfunction, uh, sexual abuse, abandonment, divorce, uh, exposure to pornography, and broken relationships. And like I said, um, that list could go on and on and on. Uh, but those are just a few similarities I see just as far as their, as far as their upbringing and their background, um, as I thought about that. The second thing is that traffickers um, often target online individuals are, sorry, traffickers often target individuals who have substance use disorders um, and use uh, the promise of unlimited drugs to keep them under control. So a perpetrator uh, may take uh, may stake out a meth clinic uh, for potential victims or others uh, even sold into the trade by other addicted family members. Uh, once trapped by a trafficker, it becomes more bearable to stay high on drugs than to endure the pain and suffering um, of a life of a prisoner. Oftentimes, uh, the victim becomes more dependent upon the trafficker uh, for addictive drugs. Uh, C, uh, drugs often used as a means of keeping those uh, who have been victimized vulnerable. Those who have been forced to work in the sex industry often uh, are often forced by their pimps or traffickers to take drugs in order to remain vulnerable to the buyers. This now leads to victims uh, becoming addicted and now needing treatment all because of their pimp or trafficker. And, you know, throughout the years, um, as I was first uh, becoming aware of this issue several years ago, that's one of the things that really stuck out to me. And it really, it really made me mad. Um, and it really spurred me to take action because, you know, I found out that, you know, they're, they're forced to take drugs in order to be deemed marketable, to be, to be weakened, right. Through that, through that experience. And, I just to have that happen to somebody um, is just on call for it's 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 
demonizing, you know, to people and um, it should not be happening. And so um, that's one of the reasons I put that there. I just wanted to bring that up. Um, substance abuse uh, treatment for survivors uh, of human trafficking. This is some treatment. Uh, a person who lived under the control of others may live in fear of both uh, freedom and withdrawal from drugs. It is not uncommon for them to feel anxiety, depression, or post-traumatic stress disorder uh, as a result of forced activities and dependence upon substances. The road of recovery may be challenging, but help is available um, in Adult and Teen Challenge. Uh, we want to do everything we can do uh, to help with hope within reach of every addict. We understand uh, that we must first address the traumatic experiences that a person has experienced before we can treat them for their drug and alcohol addiction. A person won't be able to focus on their sobriety uh, if they have experienced a high level of trauma, and that takes time uh, for us. So those are a few points that I just wanted to bring up um, as part of this. I'm just trying to really draw attention to the connection between uh, at least some of them between drug and alcohol addiction and, and uh, human trafficking. So got about three minutes till the next session. So with that, if anyone has questions uh, or wants to dialogue a little bit, I'm open to it. Great, Phil. Let me just check and see if I've got any more questions popping up. <clears throat> I think, I think we're okay. I, I just want to say, uh, in closing, Phil, the, the work you guys are doing at Adult Teen Challenge is, is really important. I'm glad you're delving into this incredible and incredibly challenging issue of human trafficking, probably the least understood yeah. crime happening in our, our community. And so thanks for your work there. Keep up the good work and we'll, we'll be in touch. Thanks for participating today. Thank you, Ray.